Wholesalers, welcome back to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. You know, we are well north of 150 episodes, and it's a good time to reflect on some of our most listened to episodes. This is the second in a series of most listened to shows that will thread together for you. We've got three amazing guests today. Uh, Rob Salafia talked about the importance of story selling, and I know you're going to get a lot out of that discussion. Bill Edmonds is a former center of influence at Merrill Lynch now a trainer and a coach. He says, if you don't differentiate, you don't resonate. And boy, isn't that the truth. So I hope you'll listen to that one if you haven't already. And then John Rulin. John Rulin takes the art of gifting and steps it up many notches. So if you're a giver of the golf ball and a giver of the pen and want to get into a whole different gift-giving stratosphere, I certainly suggest that you give that episode a listen. Let me thank you for being a loyal listener of the New Wholesaler Masterminds radio show and ask you one very small favor, and that is if you're enjoying what you listen to here, jump out to Apple Podcasts and uh, give us a rating if you would, please. We sure would appreciate that. Meanwhile, here's the next episode in our best of series. Wholesalers, I got, I got something to tell you before we start the show. If you're thinking about employing a scheduler, I wanna make you aware of an awesome opportunity Wholesaler Masterminds Schedulers has an offer for you exclusively as a listener of the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. It's 50% off, 5-0, 50% off a three-month prepay. If you want more information about the 50% off offer, go to Wholesaler Masterminds, find Wholesaler Masterminds Schedulers, and call Melanie or email Melanie. Tell her you heard about it right here on the show. Welcome to the only podcast on the planet dedicated to exploring the art, science, and lifestyle of wholesalers and their leaders. This is the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. I'm your host, the founder of Wholesaler Masterminds, Rob Shore. So here's a question for you, wholesalers. Last time you did a presentation in front of a group of advisors or stood up at a conference to make an important presentation, a road show, how effectively did you tell stories? You know, sometimes when I'm working with clients, and I don't do presentation training uh, per se, but sometimes they'll ask me some questions while coaching clients about their presentation skills. And we work on openings. How do you open a meeting as an example? And then for too many wholesalers, opening means, hey, thanks for having me in today. It's really delightful to be here. I want to cover X, Y, and Z. And as soon as you've said it's delightful to be here, half the audience is undoubtedly tuning out. And we always talk about the importance of story, which is why I'm absolutely delighted to present you with today's show. Today's guest is a speaker, executive coach, and corporate storyteller. He combines two decades of experience as a top leadership development executive with well-established career in performing arts. He has a passion for helping leaders enhance their presence, connect authentically with others, and tell engaging stories. He helps sales leaders bring their products and services to life in a compelling and relevant way, connecting to every person in the room. Rob Salafia is the founder and president of Protagonist Consulting Group. He's highly skilled working one-on-one -on -one as well as facilitating small and large group learning sessions. Rob is a lecturer in MIT Sloan School of Management and an executive coach for MIT Sloan Fellows, AMP, and EMBA programs. His clients are many amongst the Fortune 500, including Alliance Bernstein, American Express, ING Bank, as well as Fidelity. Rob Salafia, welcome to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. <laughs> I love the introduction. More than anything else, I love the way you use your voice. Oh, well, thank you. I, I love the way you use your voice because a great story needs to be engaging oh, and you kicked it off nicely all the other stuff is just you know hoopla but i really you, you brought me in with your voice thank you for having me on your show well it's very generous of you to say that and we are delighted to have you here so so let's start with uh setting the table here um great i know you know you're not the only person to talk about storytelling lots of people fashion themselves as crafts people, craftspersons, whatever that is, of storytelling. But I want to I set the baseline here. It, from your vantage point, especially with that background in performing arts, what is 
storytelling, and why should we think about using it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, stories do something that is remarkable, that just bullets and facts cannot do. Stories engage people. They, they allow people to, they, they actually disengage the critical mind. You know, so if someone is in an audience and their arms are folded, what's in their mind? They're thinking like, okay, why should I listen to you? That... And as soon as you start with an image or some kind of a uh, putting that person into the story, like, like you engage, all of a sudden they perk up cause, because we're hardwired to listen to stories. You that's know, just the beginning. You, you know, we can move people. You, you said something there that's so important. I want to make sure that our audience heard that wholesale. Did you hear what he said? Disengage the critical mind. And, and how much time wholesalers do we spend in front of advisors and their entire point of view, their entire mindset is set to critical. So, so if for no other reason, if you can disengage the critical mind, getting better at stories is going to serve you well. Now, I, I want to go to something that was in the notes that you provided for me, and I thank you for those. You, you, ha you had an aha moment when you were uh, meeting with folks at Walt Disney. And I want you to tell me a little bit about that story because the question that, that they proposed or that that woman posed to you is really interesting. I'd like, to, I'd like to know more about that. Well, I, I'm in a meeting with folks from Disney, and leadership development folks, and we're talking about presence and storytelling. That's what we're talking about. Okay. At the end of the meeting, she turns to me and says, so, Rob, how would you like us to think about you? <laughs> I sat back in my chair. I was, she was on the phone. I saw the, uh, looking at the person, it, it was like, I, I fumbled an answer. Honest to God, I fumbled an answer. And I talked around it. As soon as I went home, I went, think of me like this. Think of, think of me like this. And I started to write, I, I just started to write from that, so that starting point. You know, think of me as an extended member of your team. Think of me as someone that is a partner with you. I'm, I'm a thinking partner with you. Think of someone that I will challenge you when you need to be challenged. You know, and all of those things, that's what I started to write down. And I'm still thinking about that question three years later. <laughs> it really is a challenging question. I mean, it just, it just, when I read it, I started scratching my head. I'm like, geez, how do I want my audience to think about me? How do I want my clients to think about me? How do I want my family and friends to think about me? It's really an interesting question. We won't spend too much time there, but boy, that one resonated. Well, what, but, but if you think about it like this, it's, it's, it is your brand. In other words, it's become sticky. And so I think of personal brand as an experience. It's how people experience you physically, energetically, emotionally, intellectually. It's how they experience themselves when they're with you. Do they feel valued by you? It's also the story they tell about you when you're gone. Mm. And that is what wholesalers, I think, if you think about it from that perspective, you want to be memorable. You want your stories to be memorable as well. It's how you show up and engage with people. Obviously, or maybe not so obviously to you, Rob, uh, I don't know if you know you hit the nail right on the head because you know we spend a lot of time talking about what's your MQ, what's your memorability quotient, what allows you to stand out from the sea of sameness. And if you're, a, if you're able to either hardwire or rewire a center of influence, a financial advisor, a prospect, an existing client, if you're able to get inside their head by virtue of the stories that you tell, this is a very, very powerful tool that you have in your tool belt. When do you use stories? When, 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 when am I supposed to use a story? I mean, I, I, can't, I can't spend my day in a world of storytelling, or can I? Because I actually do have hard facts and figures I need to bestow upon the client. It's part of my job. You know, it's a really good question. And sometimes it, it's defining, it, it's, it's your definition of a story. A story can be six words. Um, it can be a, a good question. It can just like I, I think I, I sent you this 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 idea when when somebody says to you, "So what do you do?" 
and you say, well, I'm a financial advisor with such and such a company, click, they turn off. If you said to them, um, I, what do I do? I get people to live their dreams. And the person goes, what? It creates a little anticipation. That's the essence of a story, anticipation. Mm. So how does the person respond? Well, how do you do that? And then you lead with a question. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you have any dreams that you feel are unattainable that you'll never get to live? And all of a sudden, that person is like you're in a conversation with that person. You just opened a door. And now all you have to do is listen to that person's story. That's your job is to ask the most powerful question you can ask at that time. That's a powerful story in and of itself. It tells a story about who you are, that you care about someone else, and that you're not just there telling how smart you are. You know, sometimes we think about stories, or maybe it's just me. I think about it has to be uh, a recollection. I have to be able to, you know, tell that that uh, pithy tale of something that happened to me when I was 21 years old, or I need to recount something mm-hmm. that happened when in my 35 year old career, or you know. But it doesn't have to be that, from what I hear you saying. You, you can you can uh, craft what you're saying in a story format. It doesn't have to necessarily be uh, a fable, if you will. Well, the story that you just identified is usually a values-based story. And it's a powerful story to help uh, people understand who you are and what's important to you. It's a great leadership story. When we're talking about wholesalers, it's how do you differentiate yourself? How do you be memorable? So it's a story. It's how do you draw a story about someone else? And you get on stage. Let's let's say you're a wholesaler and you bring in um, a great speaker to, um, you know, a group of advisors. When you get on that stage, how do you introduce that person that really sets that person up? It isn't just it's going to be a great person. You know, you have to tell you they're going to be really expensive, but you know what? No. You say, let me tell you about this person. And set that person up with anticipation. Don't just show up and wing it. You know, do your research. Talk about that. You know, listen to what's important to that person. Find that interesting little tidbit. So then when you say, hey, I just had a conversation with that this next speaker. And what I found out was, we have something really in common. And all of a sudden, you start telling a story about you, how you just had a conversation with that person. That's engaging. So it's learning how to be facile with, with what's important. It, what does that show? It shows relational intelligence. And it says, I'm really excited about this person who we brought in. I think you're going to find a lot of value in what this person has to say. So it's, it's just shifting from facts and just a linear to, hey, let me give you a little window in, into what just happened. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the whole notion of telling stories around product. I want to I unpack that a little further because sure. generally most wholesalers are going to tell their, it's funny, we call it a product story. It, it is, it's oftentimes the farthest thing from a story as I believe you would assess it. How do we begin to approach stories around products, especially as I alluded to earlier, when those products are filled with important factoids that the advisor needs to know in order to help make a decision about my company's product versus the competitors. How do I begin to approach stories in that framework? Now, it's, it's a great, another great question. I think the most powerful way to use a story in that regard is the impact. It's not about just benefits and features. It's about the impact that 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 product could have on on their client, for their client. In other words, um, put that client as the main character in the story. Do I put that first? I got a question. Relatable. Do I put because you 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 and I talked and you know wholesalers. Do I put the client at the center of the story or I put the advisor at the center of the story? Because everybody's in it for themselves, right? At some degree. So so you would recommend either one. Either one, either one. It all depends on what you're trying to do. So if you can say, listen, um, uh, like, it's like when, when I, I wrote the, um, 
I wrote that short blog, uh, that short article that will be um, in advance of this of this um, podcast. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, like, this is this is my process. I said, okay, let me put myself in the wholesaler's point of view um, and describe their situation. So I said, it's pitch day at the wholesalers conference. You've taken the stage and are standing in front of a room full of financial advisors who, uh, whose eyes are half glazed by relentless droning of ghost-like speakers and number-crunching slides. You stand unfazed. You're actually feeling a bit excited. You pause, you take a deep breath, you survey the audience, you smile. You look at one person directly and in a confident and steady voice you ask, so what do you say when someone walks up to you and says, what do you do? So that's what I carved out. That was a story. Wholesalers, so I could go on well, to hold, hold, right that, hold, hold that thought, Rob. I want to comment. Yep. Uh, uh, wholesalers, I want you to go back and I want you to listen to that. I want you, I want you to literally uh, go to your iPhone, hit the, hit the either 15 or 30 second rewind. I can't remember what it was. Hit that a couple of times. Go back and listen to that again. Because what, what Rob has just articulated and knows as a professional speaker is that that setup right there, you took your position on the platform. You took that imperceptible deep breath. You zeroed in on a member of the audience and you let loose with your opening statement. That's the way that you engage the audience. Rob, I wanted to make sure that didn't go away because if any learning was valuable inside of this discussion, that one certainly was. And, and so what I did inside of that, Rob, was I, I described all of the things that I teach when I teach my programs on presence and storytelling. Every one of those things is a reminder of what I'm, I encourage people to do. So in the story, I'm putting in all of the information that is critical for what the learning, for, for what I want people to be thinking about. They can go back and listen to it. They say, no, I'm feeling comfortable and confident. I take the stage. I pause. I take a deep breath. I look at the audience. I smile. I look at someone directly, and I connect with them, and I ask a question. So that is a, you know, if you practice just that from a presence perspective, it's very powerful. So inside of a story like this, you could say, okay, let's, let's make it a wholesaler story. Wholesaler comes up and says, so here you are, financial advisor. You're walking into a one-on-one conversation with the top, the top um, client you've been trying to get in front of for years. You put your hand on the doorknob. You take a breath. You pause. You open the door. You walk in. So in other words, can you, can, as a wholesaler, tell a story that is relevant and, and to the financial advisor that encourages them to be their best self when they're going in to connect with their, with their clients. Let, let me ask you a question about this whole notion of, of, of storytelling. How creative do I need to be? You see, I suspect that there might be some segment of our listening audience that thinks, well, you know, crafting stories takes creativity and I don't consider myself to be a wildly creative person. I'm super good at my product. I know my product cold. I know the competitor's product cold. I know how to S-E-L-L sell, but I'm not terribly creative. Rob, does, does storytelling require creativity? Oh, well, there's a notion that people think that they're not creative. Everyone's creative. And so I'd say, yes, it takes a bit of creativity, but no, it's more craft than anything else. Define the if difference. You can craft um, explain the difference is is um, if I know how to tell a story. In other words, I'm going to put the person. I'm going to have a main character. So that main character is a person. So I just like like in my story, I said, okay, it has to have a main character. They have to have a worthy challenge. They have to describe the context of the situation. I, I said pitch day at the wholesalers conference. You know that's the context. You've taken the stage. You, wholesaler, main character. And so I put up a, a, a worthy challenge, which is you have to overcome this audience that is half asleep and glazed over. So how do you go about doing that? You do it by connecting. So it's a 
formula that you can follow. And when you learn the formula, then you can just apply that formula in a number of different ways. And you don't have to be the most expressive person in the world. You just have to write down that formula and think from the other person's point of view. So it's less creative. It's just more of a step-by-step process that you can learn. And then it's trial and error in practice. You come from a performing arts background in part. And I'm just curious, do, does, I don't want to ask the obvious, obviously answered question. Mm. How much does a performing arts background, how much if you were the, you know, the, the, the drama class nerd in high school, how much does that help you in crafting stories and delivering better stories? Um, anytime I work with someone that has a little bit of background in theater or have been playing in high school, what it does is it clicks them in and goes, Ooh, I used to do that. Oh, I remember that. And, and all of a sudden they remember it. When I work with someone that has never done it before, I'm introducing them to some really basic core exercises and that anyone can learn. It's, 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 what you did at the beginning of the podcast, you, you almost did it like a radio drama. You went, wholesalers, and you, you allowed yourself to get into it. So I work with people, and I, if, if, if they have kids, I said, do you read stories to your kids? How do you read those stories? Learn how to be more fluid and flexible with your voice. Let it have more expression. So we'll work on the voice. Then all of a sudden... They're starting to get a feel for it. They know what it is to practice, why they would going, why, why they would practice it, and then how they can put it into practice. And I think one of the most important things that I learned in uh, years in theater was the discipline of practice. Mm. And I think that's where people say, "Well, okay, I'm just going to." You know, I, I would ask people who are listening right now, "How many times have you just?" Okay, if you're going to be speaking by yourself or you're going to be speaking with other people, you're thinking about it in the cab ride uh, over, as opposed to thinking about it well in advance and preparing this and practicing it. Practicing out loud. Practicing out loud, wholesalers. Because most wholesalers, and I'm going to lump everybody together because I believe it's true, most wholesalers are not practicing their presentations out loud. Most wholesalers are winging it. And, and there's another level for you to achieve, which is a whole nother podcast for another day. Wholesalers, if you are interested in having Rob work with your sales team, if you're interested in having him work with your financial advisors, you want to bring him into a meeting, et cetera, hit up WMM Speakers Bureau at w, Wholesaler Mastermind Speakers Bureau at WMM Speakers, WMMSpeakers.com. Rob Salafia, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thanks, Rob. What if we had a guest today for you that brought all kinds of different magic to the podcast? Magic in the form of having been a former branch manager and complex director for BOA Merrill Lynch. Magic in the form of someone who got clarity through a significant life challenge and magic through someone that understands what the coaching function is like. Those are some coming attractions of today's show. Wholesalers, welcome back to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. Today's guest has spent 30 plus years in our world, our world of financial services. He joined Merrill Lynch as a financial advisor in 1991 He was Chairman's Club producer during his tenure as a producing FA. He became a regional, excuse me, a resident director, that is a producing manager, and was named Manager of the Year on two separate occasions. He joined the executive ranks of the firm in 2006 as a director, where he continued until his retirement. His most recent post prior to retirement was director of the Columbia Complex Wholesalers. I bet some of you know that complex well. And he took the market from 80 advisors and $65 million in revenue to 125 advisors and over $107 million in revenue in a short seven-year period. Subsequent to his retirement, he is now a coach and a speaker. He coaches with a belief that one size doesn't fit all. FAs don't necessarily need more content. They need more application. 
And most advisors know what they can do, but often struggle on how to do it. As you might imagine, we'll have no shortage of things to talk about. Bill Edmonds, welcome to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. Thank you, Rob. It's great to be here. It is delightful to have you here, sir. Let, let's set the table. So your 30-year, we, we share some parallels, right? 30-year-plus career in financial services before branching out into the cold world of entrepreneurial America. 30 years probably in a fairly uh, safe and womb-like environment at Merrill Lynch. Why leave? Ooh, great question. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I had a, a near-death experience, Rob. And um, if you look that up, near-death experience, that's really the seeing the light and all that. I didn't get quite that far. I came close enough to looking over the edge. Uh, I had all, always wanted to help people, uh, even you know, back when I was in college, I had a degree in sociology and sort of wanted to save the world. And then I discovered capitalism, which I thought was a very novel idea. I didn't realize it was centuries old. But anyway, I, I caught that uh, caught that dream. And the thing that I liked most about being an advisor and being a director in, in management was, was helping people get to the next level. So the things that I enjoyed most about what I did was was coaching and consulting, taking a problem, taking an FA that has a particular problem or a particular opportunity, say, how can we, we turn that into business for you? So that was that was always my dream. But what I found myself doing, I found myself doing a lot of things that I did not completely enjoy. So let's just say that the, the, the parts of the, the, the role that I love uh, <laughs> were getting smaller and smaller. It's a great experience. I love the company. Got great friends. Uh, you know, I'm a long-term Merrill Lynch guy. But I found myself three years ago, it's December the second, uh, 2013, with a very bad headache, and I was headed up to see one of my good friends, uh, Jeff Erdman, who's the top producer with Merrill Lynch, to take a group of financial advisors on what I call an an EC field trip. Perhaps we can talk about that later. But I had a very bad headache, and I don't get headaches. And so I said, well, you know, maybe I should call the doctor. So I called my doctor, and he said, well, come on in. So I found myself about an hour later speaking with him, and he says, you're going for an MRI. <laughs> an MRI? Yes. And so anyway, I, I went for an MRI. As soon as I came out of that, Rob, he was on the phone. And he says, Bill, you're going straight to the hospital. You have a subdural hematoma. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I don't know many medical terms, but I knew that one. And, and here's what's here's what's really strange about that. The reason I knew that term is because I had a mentor who actually uh, sponsored me for this level of leadership that I was in, who died one year earlier of subdural hematoma. Wow. So I, I will tell you, Rob, that I was stopped in my tracks, and, and I knew how serious it was. Went to the to the hospital. They will be past everybody. Code red. Mr. Edmonds is here. Went in there. I found myself uh, shortly after a CT scan talking with a neurosurgeon who was by my side. And she was beginning to explain to me what I had, showed me the blood on my brain, and said, if we don't get this taken care of, you're, you're going to die. Do you have a living will? And, and when someone asks you, do you have a living will? It's, it's like, time out. I'm not ready for this. Oh, yeah. And so I won't go into all of the, the, the many things that I thought about at that particular point in time and in the days and months afterwards. But let's just say what it really caused me to do is think about the things that I love to do the most. And to back up just a little bit, one of the things that I had done, one of the best decisions I ever made in my life, Rob, was to hire an executive coach. And I did that about seven years ago. And what he did with me is he helped me work on my strengths. So I went back and reviewed my strengths. And we, we spent so much time working on our weaknesses. But I went back and looked at my strengths and what the things I like to do, the things, quite frankly, that my teachers told me I was good at when I was in high school and in college. So what if? And, and so writing was one of those, speaking was one of those. And, and the core of it was 
what if I could just do the things that I love the most? What if I could just work with financial advisors and help them get to the next level? And so, uh, you know, I looked, I was making a great income with Merrill Lynch, and quite frankly, that was one of the hardest things for me to say goodbye to because I wasn't ready. I knew I wanted to do this with my life, but <laughs> I was not. I was going to do that like in, in four years. So long story short, Rob, I, I, I shortened that. I said, you know what? Now's the time to do it. And I went out and do it, did it. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been at it for a couple of years now and I'm having the time of my life and, and really am making more impact, quite frankly, than I was making in my role uh, there at Merrill Lynch. Bill, the, the, the story is inspiring. And, and we, we, we share, as I said, some, some common ground, you know, that, that 30 year financial services career where you're making a lot of money and you finally make a decision to <laughs> right. carve off into something else. Yours was inspired by something very different than mine. So there's two roads that we have to discuss today. And to, as I said to you in the pre discussion, I'd be remiss if we didn't spend some time because of the positions and stature that you had at your former firm. I'd be remiss if we didn't offer our wholesalers some insights into your dealings with wholesalers, what you found attractive, what annoyed the crap out of you. We have to pick your brain on that because I would just be derelict in my responsibilities if we didn't. And then I want to move over to the other road in the other direction and talk about North Star, which is the name of your firm, and some core beliefs that you have and the whole notion of people having their purpose. But if you'll permit me, let, let's, let's start out over on the um, characteristics of wholesalers that, that you not only worked with, but grew relationships with, that you found accretive to your business, uh, that didn't give you uh, one of the aforementioned, though not as serious, headaches. Uh, what was it about wholesalers that you enjoyed, and, and what was it about wholesalers that you found quite troubling? Well, when you said annoying, so let's start with that one. All right. Most, annoy, most annoying phrase or question, got a minute? Wholesalers, I'm, I'm going to stop you along the way because I have to highlight <laughs> these. I have to, I have to uh, audio phonically uh, highlight these, got a minute. Because uh, when they say got a minute, what do you hear? Uh, well, first of all, I hear myself saying no. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> But it's, here's what I hear. I hear the same, it's the same speech. Got a minute is what everybody says. Well, what they mean is really, you know, can I come in? Mm -hmm. And it's a very apologetic approach. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an assumption that um, you know, I'm going to take some of your time, and probably what I'm going to say is not going to be worth your time. So it, it, it does not differentiate. From everybody else, and that's problematic. There, there's there's a lot wrapped up in the last two sentences. So uh, the approach is all wrong, and because the approach is wrong, your rightful belief is that what's going to come after the "got a minute" is going to be the same pablum that everybody else is going to hurl at you. That's mm -hmm. what that's what I heard yes. you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, exactly. I have to imagine there are wholesalers that broke the mold that actually, from the time they offered their first utterance, had you thinking differently about what was to come after that first sentence. What did they say? Mm -hmm. Well, what I, would say, what I would say is they had an approach called content marketing. And I don't know, is that, is that, are you familiar with that phrase? Well, I know exactly what content marketing is and the way I describe it, but in deference to the position that you have and held, you describe it. This is, this is a, a new phrase for me in the last couple of years. And, and what I would say is a lot of the wholesalers that use content, content marketing don't really realize what they're doing. Let me give you an example. Back in the late 1800s, John Deere decided that instead of just putting out a catalog, to farmers saying, here's a tractor, look at it, here's how much it costs, buy it. What they did is they started a magazine called The Furrow, F-U-R-R-O-W. By the way, that magazine is still in print today. But instead of saying, hey, here's a tractor, here's how much it costs, they came up with a, a magazine, uh, a, a periodical for farmers 
that would tell them how to be better farmers, that would give them ideas on how to how to be better at their craft. Uh, fast forward several years later, I think it was in the 30s, Michelin did the same thing. Michelin decided they were going to put out a roadmap. And, and instead of saying, here, buy all these tires, look at this, uh, this catalog, here's something we can help you with. And, and my understanding is that is still around today. So the idea is this. People are going to buy your product because it's, it makes sense for the clients and because you've added some sort of value. So content market is simply saying, how can I help you? How can I add value to you? And it's really, Rob, answering the question before it's asked. Here's something that may help you. And when a wholesaler says, here's something that may help you, and this is how it works, this is what it is, is a whole lot different from saying, got a minute. You know, in, in our practice, we talk a lot about PVP, peerless value proposition. It's the brand of the wholesaler that stands proudly next to the brand of the company that they serve. And it's not about their trademark, which might be the fact that they always wear blue pinstripe suits and bow ties. Mm -hmm. It's the peerless value proposition is the brand as an example. I am the wholesaler that's going to bring your financial advisors in your office, Mr. Center of Influence, Mr. Branch Manager, Mr. Complex Director. I'm going to bring those advisors better education on genera generational wealth transfer, how not to blow up their book through asset transfer, death and asset transfer. That's something that I think we can you know, work on together to make your advisors better. Mm -hmm. is, is that the kind of content marketing that started to ring true for you? Absolutely, and I, and I will also say this, that and I had, I had a mentor years ago who said to me, hey, Edmonds, you can't fool the players, and FAs are a very smart bunch of people. You, you get one chance. I mean, we all get one chance to make a great first impression. You get one chance to put good content in, in front of them. So a lot of times people would, I, I think there was a, an op uh, maybe a, a, an approach to say, hey, I've got something good for you. And the wholesaler that was bringing it knew it wasn't that good, but they said, if I could just get in. Mm -hmm. and, and it needs to be quality. It needs to be something that doesn't just get you in the door, but quite frankly, keeps you in the door once you get in there. That was my next question. Did you actually have wholesalers that you thought were partners in your business when you thought about the year ahead, when you thought about your meetings, when you thought about your training, when you thought about how you would integrate knowledge to your financial advisors? Did you think about them, about wholesalers in your mix? Yes, uh, absolutely. And what was it about the wholesalers that, that, you know, whether it was the content marketing piece or still something else, what was it about those wholesalers that, that, they were able to, to break through the noise and begin to form these meaningful partnerships, sometimes perhaps consultative, consultative partnerships with your practice. Mm -hmm. How did they break through? Well, let's talk about what they didn't do. They didn't come in and say, I'll only take a minute of your time and, and put a brochure in front of them. <laughs> what they did was they, they didn't have anything in their hand. They said, what are you looking for? What, what, how can I help you with your financial advisors in the coming year? That, that was one approach. Now, once you got to know those people, you knew the value of the product that they were delivering. So I will, I will mention uh, one particular wholesaler uh, that was very good. His, his firm was very good, and he was very good at bringing a, a lot of behavioral finance mm. Um the, uh, material to the table. And I think, Rob, that that is the most needed thing today because investment advice has been, I'm going to be kind here and say, largely commoditized. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we could argue that it's been virtually completely commoditized. And, and that, is, that is the challenge. I think a lot of financial advisors are having trouble moving to that model. You, you had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, was, and, and, I, and I'm sorry I can't think of who it was. Maybe you can help me here. But here's, here's what he said, something like this. He said, you know, 25 years ago, we offered people 
investments. We offered them stocks, and we charged a commission for them to purchase that. So we charged them a fee, a transaction fee, and then we gave them free advice. Today, we charge them for advice, and we give them free trades. Hmm. So it's a great way of, of describing how the business has changed. And here's the problem. Back when we charged people a commission for the product, let's just say a mutual fund, you know, A share, B share, C share, the company set the price. So we knew what our value was, whether or not it was any good, or that is our value was really of any value or not. But now we sort of have a blank can. And since we know, and I, I continue to say we because I was a financial advisor for over 16 years, is that we, we've got the blank canvas, and, and we don't feel too much like a Picasso. <laughs> we feel more like a paint-by-numbers person. And all that being said, that is the way that wholesalers today can bring the most value. Financial advisors, the ones that I work with, and, and, and many of them are over a million-dollar producers, in fact, most of them, quite frankly, they're having trouble with that conversation and they really don't know how to talk to anybody about it. So if the question is not being answered, or excuse me, if the question is not being asked, and, and if I could give any advice today for wholesalers, is go, go out there knowing that's what they're asking, but they're not asking it, and you have the answer. Bill, I, I thank you for that <clears throat> bit of insight. Let's, let's, let's move off in, in the other direction. So okay. the other road that I said we were going to travel today. So you, you, you have this, you know, scarier than all get out health issue you start to think about you know what's your real purpose tell us what the meaning because i know it has meaning to you what's the meaning of north star how do you define your purpose though you alluded to it earlier how are you helping advisors define their purpose tell us a little bit about that please yeah boy i'd love to um you know i started off i wanted a name i've always been one of these people that I'm, I'm a big ideas person, uh, and if you're familiar with the Strength Finders uh, Index, yep. uh, idea, ideation is my number one. So I've always been an ideas person. I've always felt that if something has a name, it needs to have a meaning. Um, and so I thought about Polaris because Polaris is the name of the North Star. And I, I just said, you know, I, I want to go with North Star. I looked around, a lot of North Stars out there. But I said, you know, this is what really means a lot to me. And what I realized in my own life is that I started off with a lot of purpose and, uh, you know, coming out of, coming out of college and even, even as a young financial advisor, I had a lot of purpose. And what I would say is we talk about it in the industry. We talk about style drift with managers. I call it purpose drift. And, you know, we get busy, we get on the treadmill, somebody turns the speed up a little bit. It's easier just to pick up the pace rather than to get off the treadmill and sort of think, well, why am I doing this? And so the Polaris, the North Star, is the only star in the sky that does not move. It is the polar star. And for centuries and centuries, it has been used as the, the sort of the benchmark for navigation. And just a side story, I've got a good friend of mine by the name of Charlie Duke. Uh, if that may, name sounds familiar, Charlie was actually one of the astronauts who, who walked on the moon, who was part of Apollo um, 16. And Charlie was telling me, he said, Bill, every one of the Apollo spaceships, those capsules, was equipped with a sextant so that if we lost power, we would be able to come back by that North Star. And and the, the problem that, that people have is those who started out with a purpose have sort of lost that purpose. They've, they've had purpose drift. And then I will tell you that I find a lot of people out there, and especially, say, over, over 40, 45 years old, 50, who just are, are quite honest enough to say, I'm not sure what my purpose is. And one of my favorite writers, a guy by the name of Rick Warren, wrote this book called The Purpose Driven Life. He's got a great quote in there, and he says, Life without purpose is motion without meaning, activity without direction, and events without reason. Motion without meaning, 
activities without direction, and events without reason. And sometimes I find in many of my clients, if they just stop long enough to maybe get off that treadmill, first of all, the treadmill is still going to be there, okay? It's still going to be there. Step off for a minute, take some time to think, and and really figure out what is your why. What is the reason you're doing what you're doing? And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention another thing. There's a guy named Alden Cass. And I don't know if you're familiar with Alden. He'd be a great, great guest for you sometime. But he's a psychologist in New York City. And he has a practice dedicated just to serving financial advisors. And he did some research a few years ago and found out that financial advisors have four times the rate of clinical depression than the average person in the, in the U.S. And if you look at that group, Rob, the highest incident of that group are the highest producers. So the elephant in the room is more production, more money, more things. It's all nice. I'm driven. You're driven. We're all driven. But at the end of the day, there's got to be something more than just 20% growth, 15% growth, growth. And what I spend a lot of my time is helping people reinvent themselves. So if I could just sort of wrap it up here, one of my clients said to me, million and a half dollar, million, million six producer, he said to me last year, December, he said, Bill, you know, I made 700 grand last year. You've got to help me have some fun this year. Now, that was his number one goal. Great business, a business, $300 million in assets. 84 clients, the kind of business people would kill for. And he said, look, 50 years old, I just need to have some more fun. And you know what? If we could have more fun at what we do, how much more productive could we be? How much say, energy yeah. do we get from that? Uh, I was going to say, the ability to crack through and have more fun is only going to breed more enjoyment of the job. And to breed more enjoyment of the job is just going to add to being able to do more of the work that you would then enjoy Uh, And I'm sure wholesalers, you can relate to uh, finding yourself in a position at some point in your career where you've cracked the code on the income, but then you turn around and say, but damn it, this thing is no fun anymore. (laughs) So it's an interesting thing. Bill, we could go on, but we can't go (laughs) on because the shot clock is not our friend. Um, I thank you for joining us to go down both paths, sharing us a little bit of wisdom about your extensive experience in the branches. And then, of course, giving us some insights into your work at North Star Leadership Solutions. I hope you'll have a chance to come back and see us again. Would love to do that, Rob. I appreciate the time today. It's uh, it's, it's an honor. And I've, I, as I told you before, I've, I've listened to your show and found uh, your episodes to be extremely helpful. And, and uh, thank you for doing what you do. If you spent any time looking at wholesalermasterminds.com, if you've read any of the books, if you have watched any of the videos, you know that one of the cornerstones of what we think and what we believe and know to be true revolves around how to increase your MQ, your memorability quotient. How will advisors know that you were in their office, save the footsteps in the carpeting on your way out? We say that all the time. And today's guest, today's guest is going to be so much fun to talk to because we're going to give you some very actionable ideas to increase your memorability in a big way. Wholesalers, welcome back to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. Wholesalers, what's in your trinket and trash closet right now? Come on, look around your office. What's in your trinket and trash closet right now? Oh, I know. Let's see. There's pens and there's koozie cups and maybe there's some UBS thumb drives and, and, and we know just how excited advisors get about those, don't we? Gosh, they just get charged up when you walk in with the next version of the pen. Heavens knows I do. Here's my question for you. How did an Ohio farm boy become the greatest seller in Cutco's now almost 70-year history? And the answer is by understanding the value of gift giving and relationships. He's going to talk to us today about high-level gift giving strategies, which he began to perfect in 2000 when he formed his own firm called the Ruling Group not long after college. We'll talk about his accomplishments 
with Cutco, because frankly, I didn't even know what Cutco was before I started researching him. He'll tell us if you don't know what it is and why it's important and how he achieved number one seller status out of 1.5 million wholesalers. That's 1.5 million reps and distributors. He was number one, set a record in sales, did it in four years, hasn't been broken since. He's an animal. And the other thing I like about him, the other thing I like about him, I've never met him before, but in doing my homework, I know I'm going to have a great time with him because wholesalers, here is an entrepreneur at heart. Now, you know, maybe like you, you were washing cars and mowing lawns. Wholesalers, this dude at 12 years old was lending money back to his parents and charging 10% interest. I'm loving this guy. John Rule and welcome to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. Rob, thanks for having me, man. That's uh, that's the best, one of the best intros, if not the best intro that I've ever had. Thank uh, you. You've had many, and so I'm honored, and that's very kind. Uh, you know, you, you use a phrase that um, uh, I I love because I use something similar. You know, I talk about how much love you're going to give to advisors, and how, how do you love up your employees? And you talk about loving on people and loving on them well. And I want to talk about that, but I guess I shouldn't get ahead of myself in my enthusiasm because there's a there's a swath of our population, if they're anything like me, or maybe I'm just you know in the dark ages. What the heck is Cutco? And 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 and. What, tell us a little bit about that so we can have some context for what we're talking about here. Yeah, so it's Cutco's a, you know, it's been around for 70 years. It's kind of a under the radar company, so the fact that you haven't heard of it isn't isn't that shocking, but it's a $250 million. It's kind of the Rolex of cutlery and they have a direct sales model. They have one of their programs is a they have an internship program with college kids where there's actually some universities like Purdue and Michigan State that make it a requirement to sell Cutco in a class to get real sales world experience, but there's millions of of uh of kids that have gone through their program over the last 70 years and and um it's handmade in New York. It's it's uh, there's about 800 employees there and so it, uh, it's this world class product that uh, when I came in and started working with them, they you know they ba- basically primarily sold to homeowners, you know people that would buy a set for themselves, maybe as a Christmas gift for their for their wife or their husband or um, maybe for their second home. And we created a, a whole different program for them where we actually leveraged uh, the cutlery as a relationship building tool. It wasn't really about the knife. It was about what it represented. And we leveraged it as a tool to open up doors with, you know, CEOs of million, you know, hundred million dollar companies. And, um, but it's a small little company out of, uh, only in New York, um, that, uh, that's been around for quite a few years. So right. here, here's what, here is, here's what I'm guessing, John, I, 70 year history of Cutco knives, millions, uh, 1.5 million sellers less perhaps at the time that, that, that this became, uh, getting off the ground for you. I'm sure somebody in that 70 year history had a notion that they might go out and, and appeal to the, to the corporate seller, not just Ma and Pa Kettle. How is it that you blew the doors open? How did it become something so incredible for you when others didn't get through that wall? Yeah, well, I think that one of the biggest things was, is I had a mentor, he was an attorney. Um, it was my girlfriend's dad. So it, it, he, he, seemed to attract everything in town. Like he referrals, he owned part of the banks, he owned the oil wells, he owned the real estate that turned in magically two years later into Walmart. And so he would find, he would just, he was always giving things away. He'd find deals on noodles. He'd buy a semi load of them and everybody at church, all 200 people would walk away with like 10 cases. So I came to him and pitched them the idea. I thought, Hey, you're, you're radically generous. Maybe he'd give away pocket knives. All his clients are men, they're CEOs that are into the outdoors. And uh, we're sitting around the table and he's he gets this little glint in his eye and leans back and he said, John, what about paring knives? I'm like, I'm thinking grown men, paring knives. That's just weird. Like, why would you do that, Paul? I'll sell you as many as you want. But why? And he said, well, I figured out that, you know, that if you take care of the inner circle, if you take care of the family, everything else in business seems to take care of itself. So it was for me this lightning bolt moment that I was that Paul understood relationships at this really deep level and understood the psychology of it and that it wasn't really about knives. It was about what it represented. And so I would start to invest in my own money. You know, as a college kid or just out of college, I'd invest $200 in a carving set. And I would engrave the CEO's name and his wife's name, family name. And I'd put a little handwritten note inside saying, carve out five minutes for me. I promise it'll be worth your time. 
And I'd get the meeting and I walk into a boardroom. There's a 60 year old CEO of a hundred million dollar company there. And in walks a 22 year old. And he's like, I don't understand. Are you here to sell me knives or what, what are you doing? And, uh, and I said, no, I'm here to help your hundred sales reps open doors with your top 1000 prospects. And I'm here to do the exact same thing I did to you. I want to teach your, your sales guys and your account managers and your whatever to, to build relationships and memorable relationships at this deeper level, leveraging what we call strategic appreciation and artifacts. And we, instead of selling one set of knives in one sitting or in one, you know, over the course of a couple months, I would sell a thousand sets or 10,000 sets. So it wasn't necessarily that I was the best salesperson in the world. I just applied strategy and taught them and leveraged the knife just was the delivery vehicle. So we started to sell, you know, millions of dollars of knives because we really applied it to an overall strategy that really nobody in the history of the company had ever done. I, I just, I love the story when I first read about it. I love the story hearing you tell it to me live. And, and I want to go exactly where you just suggested. So the, the knife is the vehicle, but the things that you do around that are what's so important. Uh, and you, you, you mentioned some buzzwords as I did my homework. There's the relationship action plan. You just talked about strategic appreciation uh, again, we, we're, we're here to talk about high-level gifting strategies. W where do you recommend that we begin to, to peel this? Because there's so much there. We've got about 20 minutes to spend together. And wholesalers, here's why I got excited. I have to tell you this. Why I got excited was some of the things that, that John's book, Giftology, speaks to is how to get more referrals, how to stand out above the noise, how to get appointments when people are not giving you appointments and wholesalers, what is more difficult today than getting the advisor appointment, especially if it's a cold appointment, uh, how to actually have a gifting plan that works for you that gives back. John, where should we start? Should we talk about strategic appreciation? How do we, how do we begin to unpack this thing? Yeah. Well, I think that there's just some core principles that I think most people, whether it's wholesalers or really even our pro sports clients or some of the biggest companies in the world, they just, they, they've they either, either forgotten or they just have never been taught. I mean, there's no MBA course in gifting. Mm -hmm. So most people are sheep and they just do what everybody else does. And so they're like, hey, we got to get our brand out there and we need to do something. So they slam their logo on a bunch of stuff and hand it out and and hope for the best. And they don't realize that you know, people make decisions based upon how they feel. And if you're not thinking through the details of how you're showing gratitude and appreciation, then you're really oftentimes you're doing the exact opposite of what you want to be doing. You're investing money to offend people. And so I think that, you know, one of the first things that, that wait, Paul. Wait, wait, really wait, wait, wait. You just said something that I have to stop on because it was so right on. You're investing money to offend people. So <laughs> when we send them the beautiful uh, new shape of the Bic pen or when we send them the <laughs> koozie cup, I assume you're referring to something that is in that realm. Yes. Uh, okay. Trinkets and trash. Yeah. I mean, you're dealing with people that can afford, you know, like they're five, six, seven figure earners. Yes. And you're trying to impress them with this mediocre mass produced Chinese imported crap with your logo slammed on it. And even if it's a nice, you know, piece or a nice pen or a nice shirt that nobody wants to advertise for your brand. Like you're, you're saying here's a gift, but really I'm going to hide it and, and try to manipulate you into being a billboard for me. Like people care about themselves. They care about their own name, their own brand. And yet we try we confuse what a gift and a promotional item is. Yes. A gift should be recipient focused, all about the person you're giving it to. A promotional item that you hand out at a trade show is all about the giver. It's all about their colors, their brand, their, you know, their name, their logo. And people try to mix the two. And especially when you're dealing with advisors and high profile and, you know, higher affluent people, like they're not dumb when they get the thing. They're like it ends up at goodwill. It ends up in the trash can. And in their mind, you created a memory point of what what a cheesy SOB. Like, why would I want to sit down with that person when he tried to, like, give me this piece of crap with his logo on it? Like that it, that doesn't that doesn't emit or invoke these amazing, deep, um, you know, warm, fuzzy feelings it, it invokes the exact opposite. And so, you know, Paul was beautiful. Like not only did he give world-class things away, um, best in class things that people would actually want and use at a quality that they would feel proud of. But when you engrave it with their name, not your name, now they're in their spouse's name. Now they're actually going to take it home. And every time they use it subconsciously, if it's world-class, 
they remember where it came from. Like you don't have to put your name on it if you're giving out world class things. If you're giving away like koozies and stress balls, well, okay, then put your logo on it. But nobody is confusing that with a gift. You know, one of the strategies that we talk about at Wholesaler Masterminds in in, in our coaching practice. We talk about, and we've done some podcasts around advisor reconnaissance, but then there's the application of how to apply what you've learned. And one of the ways that we teach people to open doors is to take that advisor reconnaissance and pre-send prior to their call, on a cold call especially, pre-send the gift that touches the heart or the head. And this is, this is very similar to what you're talking about. Yours, of course, is focused on one particular product, and that's the outcome of sending one of these cutlery items. But it, it is the same principle, which is I want to be able to touch, in this case, the advisor's heart with, with that heartfelt thing that is so different than anybody else gives that will have them have the, oh my goodness, this person is different from all the rest moment and take the meeting. Yep. That's it's uh, that's it. I mean, you you have to with, with all the text messages and Facebook and all the emails and all the noise. Like you don't you, you have to be pretty special to like they already have 147 things on their list to do, and they're trying to take care of their clients and they're trying to take care. You know, they most of them probably have, are married with kids and have all these different challenges. If they're if you're going to move to the top of the list, you better be pretty like show that you're you're one in a million that you're different and. One of the few ways that I think are left to do that, like everybody does dinners and golf outings and educational seminars and all that's fine, but it's all just noise because all of the competitors are doing the exact same things. We felt we found that gifting and appreciation is one of the last levers that most people suck at. And so there's opportunity to exceed expectations and do it at a level that's special and unique and different. And and frankly, when you do things that, you know, most of the, you know, in the financial advising world, what is it? 80, 90 percent of them are men and most of them are married and they're married to women. And so including their spouse, you know, their significant other or taking care of their assistant, that inner circle, that's where a dollar spent has a hundred dollars of impact because those are the two people that are oftentimes left out of, you know, the typical like driver and golf outing and boondoggle with over cigars and drinks and all the other things that every other wholesaler does. Um, and so when you can gift well, you know, I, I tell people like if you if you gift like a king, you get treated like a king. Mm-hmm. Like it's a biblical concept from like 5000 years ago, like a gift ushers you into the presence of the great. And there's ways to do that. Not necessarily with that. You know, you don't have to like, you know, break the budget and you know spend tens of thousands of dollars on somebody to get their attention. But you do have to be just as strategic with it as you are any other part of your business. Let's let's talk a little bit about cost for a minute, because I heard you say something on a previous uh, podcast that I want to push back on. Um, yep. we, you know we work in a highly regulated industry. Um, of course. You, you know there's a FINRA $100 rule. I heard you say on a prior podcast that, uh, and, and I want to be very clear, you were not inferring that anyone should break any rules. That's not what you were saying. But you were saying that where there's, uh, what I heard you saying, let me not put words in your mouth, uh, what I heard you saying was, well, there's, where there's a will, there's a way. You can figure it out. So how, how do we figure out how to put high-level gifting strategies into a world where we are uh, monitored in terms of the gifts that we give, and there's a cap on those, a fine cap. Yep. So I, I, here's here's an interesting thing. So if you're going to try to give, you know, a watch to somebody in this industry, like you know that people are wearing like Breitlings and Rolexes, there's no way. Like you could spend a hundred dollars or fifty dollars on a fossil, and it could be a really nice watch. But when the person that you're giving it to already has a Breitling or Rolex, like they're good. It's going to get regifted. Mm-hmm. But if you take something that's, you know, let's say a knife, most people have $5 knives in their kitchen and you send them a $50 knife, all of a sudden it's remarkable because it's, you know, it's the nicest knife they've ever seen. And we've seen that done with mugs. Like I think mugs are cheesy and chintzy, but somebody made a handmade mug for me and my wife, this clay maker, and it was a hundred dollar mug. Wow. And it's the nicest mug on the planet, and I use it every single day because it's a hundred times nicer than any other mug I've ever seen. Um, so it's it's figuring out the categories where you can be remarkable and where you can personalize it, where you can be unique. And it's like my business cards. I spend three hours on my business cards, which people are like, you know, you spend three hours on coffee, it's not a big deal. You spend three hours on your business card, and even Google is like, oh my gosh, like, are you going broke passing those out? Mm-hmm. Um, and the simple fact is because most people spend five cents on their business card, a three dollar metal business card um, is remarkable. And m- most people throw away three dollar flashlights and trinkets and tape measures and koozies. And but 
where you, I, I, my big thing is where everybody else is going cheap, I go expensive. And it's still within regulations and rules and whatever else. Where everybody's going expensive, I cut it out altogether because you, you being 2% better than somebody else at a trade show or a golf outing or whatever else, it's just, it's, it's noise. It doesn't stand out. And so I think that you can be, you know, it, with some forethought. And I mean, at the end of the day, like that's what we do for clients is we help them think through the strategy and find those unique things that push the hot button, stay within rules and regulations. And we really are able to automate the process. And, and one of those things is when you get a gift and there's a really thoughtful handwritten note that comes with it, now all of a sudden, instead of it being another Amazon box that shows up that's just stuff showing up, a gift comes from a person and a person actually hands write, hand writes a note. So it's the handwritten note seems like oh, it's not worth the time. But the simple fact is, is that um, that's what makes it personal. Yep. That's what makes it unique. That's what actually connects to the heart and not it, it's not just being another package showing up. So it's all the little details around it. Like a handwritten note doesn't cost you anything but time. Um, but that's what takes it from being like just stuff to to being really impactful. What are some of the other cornerstones of the strategy? Because wholesalers, uh, John, as you're starting to get the sense, he's not just a world class salesperson of fine cutlery. He's also a, an author and a speaker and a consultant and a trainer. And by the way, if you're thinking that John would be an awesome kind of guy to have into a broker dealer meeting, to be at a road show, to speak at a conference in front of your advisors, go to WMM speakers, WMM speakers.com wholesaler mastermind speakers. We can hook you up with John and get the right content in front of the right meetings to the right advisors. John, what are some other cornerstones of the, 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 the things that you teach us about in the book? Uh, so uh, you talk about, for instance, you talk about a relationship action plan. Am I to be that pragmatic with my gifting? Yeah, I think that um, if relationships are important to you and you think that relationships are one of your most important assets, you should have a plan on how you're going to show appreciation to your key relationships. It could be 50 people, could be 20 people, could be 2,000 people, but you have to map out how you're going to stand out and be memorable with those people and, and what you're going to do and what it's going to say and when it's going to go out. And the simple fact is most people give gifts uh, very reactionary or with very, you know, with like three seconds of thought, like, oh, crap, we had a good year this year. Hey, we got to do that. You got to do that point set or, or Christmas basket we do every year and on December 15th. Hey, Susie, here's here's the budget. Do the same thing as last year. That's that's about it. You know, that 15 seconds of thought versus, wow, these are our 100 most important relationships. And if we're able to get access to these 100 people, it could it could 20x our business. And so what are we going to do? When are we going to give it? And so one of the things we talk about in the book is don't give gifts out of obligation. Don't give them at times that are expected. It needs to be a surprise and delight. And so I give away a quarter million dollars a year worth of gifts, which is to some people insane. That's a lot of money uh, by, any, by any measurement. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Guess, guess how many... I guess how much we invest between Thanksgiving and Christmas on gifting. I, I well, if it's if if it's a a portion of that, uh, what one hundred and fifty of it, one hundred and seventy five of it, zero. Oh, nothing, not one dime. So we've been called like the Grinch that wants to kill Christmas, and we've had articles written up in all kinds of magazines, and we're you know Yahoo News, and we're going to New York in a couple of weeks to to uh, to talk on some of the big talking head shows because we're a gifting company a gift strategy and logistics company that during the biggest gifting time on the planet says, don't send gifts. That's like the biggest, it's like uh, the biggest oxymoron. But the bottom line is I'm an entrepreneur. And if I spend a dollar, I want to get $10 in return, $20 in return, a hundred dollars in return. And if you give gifts when they're expected, like it, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, when everybody sends gifts, you know, the fruit baskets and the bottles of wine and the nuts and the chocolates, you're just part of the noise. Like there's a conference table that's ready to collapse in every office. People are eating and drinking themselves to death. It's the most like noisy time on the planet when all of your competitors are all having a pissing match over who can give what gift. I don't want to be a part of it. I want to give a gift in the middle of March or in the middle of July when I'm the only package that shows up that's personalized, that's unique, that they take home to their wife. And guess what? When you're the only one that does something, you're remarkable and you're ta and people talk about it and you're remembered. And so I have clients from 10, 15 years ago that are like, I still remember the first gift you sent at me. I can't believe like you sent it on X, Y, Z time. Like it was so memorable. It was so unique. It was so unexpected. But most people in business are sheep. They follow the same 
program as everybody else and they don't want to break tradition. And so they send the box of nuts and the bar of chocolate with their logo on it. And then they wonder why they don't get a response. I got to ask you something really tactical about that. I mean, super, super tactical about that. So, so I don't disagree in the least. Uh, and I thank you for the, the trap, trap and trick question. I walked right into it. Just walk right into it. <laughs> I, I, my, my neck hurts. I walked right into it. But, but here, 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 here's my question around that. Yeah. So, so if you work in, in a world, in an industry, uh, where the holiday gift, yes, we're all sheep, we all do it, and because we're all sheep and we all do it, we've done it for so many years, advisors expect to receive it. So when the holiday time comes and I am the missing link, that is to say, all of my other providers gave me something and you did not, and I don't yet know because I'm, you know, I, I've just, under, I've just uh, begun this quest of being different through my gifting. They don't know there's something coming in February or March. How do I not look like a schlep for not gifting during the holiday season when everybody else is gifting? Well, it's a, it's a great question. So two things. One is if we were having this conversation six months ago, you just preempted and, and be the first gift that they would, you'd send it out November 1st yeah. as a gratitude and thankfulness thing. And, uh, and you'd actually stand out and still be memorable and, and not be part of the noise between Thanksgiving and Christmas. The bottom line is most of the time, those gifts, the reason you don't get a bunch of thank yous is because they're given out to other people in the office and they're re-gifted and they're thrown in the trash faster than they can come in because there's so much crap that's thrown at advisors that they're trying to get their own gifts out to clients and do all the, you know, do their own shopping and host people and do parties and wrap up year end and all the other stuff that it's, uh, in nine out of 10 cases, it wouldn't even be noticed that you didn't send it. Like that's how, noisy it is. And we've had people do it. They cut it off and they're like, we're just not going to send it and see what happens. And maybe they get a phone call or two. But the bottom line is nobody notices because there's so much crap that's given at that time period that you can't even keep track of it. So, um, yeah, it, in most cases, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make an impact and wait till February and they'll be like, wow, that's amazing. Like nobody else sent me a gift around Valentine's Day. Like this is memorable versus, you know, being part of the masses. I got one other thing I want to ask you about uh, because it really underscores uh, the, 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 the massive way in which you give, uh, the, the enormity of your generosity and how you think. Uh, I did pick up on, on one of the podcasts that is it true that you still pay to have the homes of your employees cleaned every other week? Yeah, that's uh, – I mean you can't, you can't expect to, to... – model things externally that you're not willing to do internally. And so our, my business partner and I are big believers in, in practicing what we preach with our own, you know, our own staff and our own suppliers and other people that, you know, without them, we don't have a business. And so I take care of my suppliers better than most people take care of their best clients because without them, I don't have anything. And the same with my employees. We have a lot of moms that you know, have kids and husbands and uh, that work for us. And, and we decided to say, like, you know, what was something that they would want, but they'd never do for themselves and that would make their life better, their quality of life better. And, and paying to have their house cleaned, they would, if you gave them the option of cash or that, they'd take cash because they'd feel guilty about you know, taking the, the house cleaning. But the bottom line is we don't lose employees. They talk about it to, to all of their friends. Anytime we need employees, other people are like, wow, that's, that's part of the perks. Um, and we get better you know, performance out of our staff. Uh, it costs us a couple thousand dollars a person, um, but a lot of times people are like, "Well, our our salary range was forty five thousand to fifty five thousand." Like people throw around five ten thousand dollar increments on pay and don't think anything of it, and they don't they they don't understand that if you would redirect those resources at things that really matter to somebody, that for us it has ten twenty thirty forty thousand dollars worth of impact because their lives are just better, their kids' lives, their spouses' lives. It's just a it's just a huge um, way for us to model what we teach. Wholesalers, I hope, and leaders that are listening as well, I hope that this conversation with John, frankly, has your head spinning, that you're thinking about how to not be sheep, how you're thinking about how to do things differently, how you're thinking how to get yourself out of the sea of gift-giving sameness, how you're thinking about how to increase your MQ, your memorability quotient, how you're thinking about how to be more strategic with your gifting. John Ruland, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Rob, thanks for having me. This is uh, this has gone gone by way too fast. I know it has. Wholesalers, come back next time for another episode of the new Wholesaler Masterminds Radio Show. For more information about Wholesaler Masterminds, visit us at wholesalermasterminds.com. Find the new Wholesaler Masterminds Radio Show at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, 
and Spotify.